Lewis family host annual threshing day event, Daryl Knight, The Standard, North Durham. This Sunday, July 21st, the Lewis family invites the community to their annual threshing day event at their farm located at 21150 Highway 12. Starting at 1 p.m., visitors can witness historical threshing demonstrations and enjoy a classic car show. Parking is available via the lane off Scugog Concession 12. Threshing, a method used to separate grain from stalks and husks, was a pivotal agricultural process before the advent of modern machinery. Historically, farmers relied on manual tools, like flails or animal-powered threshing machines. The introduction of steam-powered threshers in the 19th century marked a significant advance forward, increasing efficiency and productivity. Today, combines have revolutionized the process, performing reaping, threshing, and winnowing all in one pass. Karen Lewis, the event organizer and a passionate advocate for preserving agricultural history, shared her thoughts on the importance of this event. Threshing Day is a day for us to honor the hard work and ingenuity of our ancestors, she said. It's amazing to think how far we've come in terms of technology and efficiency. However, it's equally important to remember and respect the roots of these advancements. The demonstrations will provide a glimpse into the labor-intensive process which was once the cornerstone of grain production. Visitors will see unique threshing machines in action, operated by enthusiasts dedicated to preserving this slice of farming heritage. Seeing these old machines working is not just a history lesson, but a testament to human innovation, Karen added. We hope to inspire younger generations to appreciate the development of farming technology. In addition to the threshing demonstrations, the event features a classic truck show showcasing a variety of restored and preserved vehicles. This aspect of the event highlights the Lewis family's love for vintage machinery, extending beyond agricultural equipment to classic trucks. The Lewis Family Threshing Day is more than an educational experience. It's a celebration of community, history, and progress. Karen Lewis is extending a warm welcome to all, ensuring a day filled with learning, nostalgia, and fun. We look forward to sharing this tradition with everyone, she said. It's a wonderful opportunity for people of all ages to connect with our agricultural past and see how far we've come. Brock's Breathtaking Moments Photo Contest now open. Daryl Knight, The Standard, Brock. The township of Brock, renowned for its stunning Lake Simcoe, expansive countryside and charming towns, is hosting the Brock's Breathtaking Moments Photo Contest 2024. Open until October 31st, this contest invites participants to capture and share the beauty of Brock's environment, architecture, and vibrant community life. Participants can submit photos featuring a variety of themes, including beaches, birding, camping, culinary experiences, culture and heritage sites, cycling, farms and farmers markets, fishing, hiking, kayaking, and paddle sports, local events and festivals, skiing and skating, other tourist attractions, and streetscapes and architecture. Each month, two winners will receive gift certificates to local Brock businesses. Prizes are awarded in two categories, one for photographers aged 13 and under, and another for those over 13. A panel of municipal employees will judge the submissions, and all decisions will be final. To participate, photographers must register or sign in at the Let's Talk Brock website, review official rules, and upload their photos with a brief description and category designation. The contest promises to showcase the unique and special aspects of Brock, celebrating its picturesque scenery and vibrant community life. Don't miss the chance to capture and share your breathtaking moments in Brock. What can you do at Uxbridge Urban Provincial Park? Courtney McClure, The Standard, Uxbridge. Did you know Uxbridge has a new urban provincial park? As of July 1st, the Uxbridge Urban Provincial Park is the newest year-round day-use provincial park in Ontario. The park covers about 1,300 acres of land, which is ecologically significant to the Oak Ridge's moraine and greenbelt. On July 1st, over 1,300 acres of Oak Ridge's moraine and greenbelt land was placed into permanent conservation protection by Ontario Parks. This land became the urban provincial park in Uxbridge. This is something to celebrate because those lands will now be there for our children and grandchildren to experience, said Colleen Baskin, the provincial park project manager at the township of Uxbridge. 
The geological features of the park protect the quality of the township's drinking water and provide a permanent green space, added Ms. Baskin. The park will also provide protection for rare and endangered species. Creating the park has also increased the amount of visitors coming to Uxbridge. Ms. Baskin said, as amenities are added and opportunities develop at the Urban Provincial Park, the township expects visitations to rise and boost the local economy. I visit the new park often to ride my mountain bike, said Uxbridge Mayor Dave Barton. This place is special because most of the current trails are constructed of flat, interlocking stones, making it easy for those of all abilities to cycle and walk. The park includes dense forests, old-growth trees, and some open meadows. It's very peaceful and quiet, said Mayor Barton. I like that. If I want a more challenging ride, I have options for longer and more technically difficult trails. He also enjoys how close the park is to urban Uxbridge. According to Mayor Barton, the provincial park is about a five-minute drive from his house. The distance between the park and the urban areas of Uxbridge means it's easier to welcome visitors to the new urban provincial park. It also makes it easier for visitors to find local shops, restaurants, and other services the town offers. The park offers fantastic potential to create trail connections between urban Uxbridge and existing world-class trail and conservation areas surrounding us, added the mayor. My vision is to support a robust tourism market by connecting the Rouge National Park to Uxbridge and beyond with green spaces and trails. Although the park currently has limited operations, it can be used for daytime self-guided tours, biking, walking, and more. You can park at these two locations. 565 Old Stoville Road, limited to six parking spaces, and 579 Old Stoville Road, limited to four parking spaces. However, motorized vehicles, camping, hunting, and campfires are not permitted. The new Uxbridge Provincial Park is fabulous news for conservationists, our local economy, and everyone in Uxbridge who enjoys the outdoors, said Mayor Barton. As this park develops over time and becomes more connected to our existing trail networks, we will have a tremendous asset which residents of the Township of Uxbridge can be proud of. Congratulations to everyone involved for making this happen in record time. If you would like to learn more about the Uxbridge Urban Provincial Park, please visit discoveruxbridge.ca. Going to hell and back. No matter how bad things get in Canada or elsewhere, there is always a way to turn things around. In fact, one country proved you can get out of hell in three weeks, for lack of a better expression. El Salvador was the murder capital of the world. It was a very dangerous place. Then they elected Nani Bukele, a Christian businessman and former mayor. He wanted to help people. What a novel idea. We haven't seen any major pro-citizen policies in Ottawa in at least five years. President Bukele wanted people to live in freedom and in peace, and he wanted to rebuild the economy. He was not a poser like far too many leaders in the Western world today, but he couldn't do it while the country was run by murderous gangs. The official version is there were six phases in the government strategy to round up the criminals, but the reason, the unofficial one, was something much different. When asked by a journalist what that was, President Bukele replied, A miracle. A miracle from God? Yes. When Naini Bukele was first elected in 2019, He knew to change the country, the people first needed to feel secure. They needed to feel safe. They needed to know they could conduct their family affairs and their business without the threat of being robbed or shot. So President Bukele's first plan of action was to end crime. He beefed up the police departments and doubled the military and devised a plan to round up tens of thousands of gangsters who controlled the streets of this small Central American country of six million people. However, in the final stages of his plan, When his law enforcement teams began to close in on the thugs, things went badly, and Naini learned gang members were also terrorists. In true terrorist fashion, they would shoot anyone to intimidate law enforcement to back off. They would shoot a taxi driver, a woman walking down the street, anyone walking by. They killed 87 people in three days. In the middle of the night, President Bukele and his cabinet watched the chaos unfold on the front lines of this battle. Video, transmitted from the flak jackets of officers and soldiers, revealed the war against crime was not going well. Nainini began to think his goal was an impossible task. He looked at the members of his cabinet and told them they needed help. They needed supernatural help. They needed God, and they needed to pray. 
So they did. Every one of them. They prayed for fewer civilian casualties and an end to the war. Not one more civilian was killed, and 70,000 gang members were rounded up in three weeks. President Bukele's government decided not to prosecute the about 100,000 collaborators, knowing most of these people, who were family members and neighbors, were pressured to comply or face being beaten or killed. It is worth pointing out the gangs were actual Satan worshippers and held satanic rituals. This is well documented. One gang member, who confessed to many killings, told a TV news crew he left the gang when he arrived at a house where other members were about to kill a baby. He objected, but another member told him human sacrifice was necessary because the beast asked for a baby. The fight against such evil was insurmountable, but with God it was easy, said President Bukele, who, after being re-elected last month, said the first order of government business is to seek God's wisdom. What? Virtually no Western leader would say that. Probably because they forgot to represent the people who elected them, responded President Bukele, noting most people would think it important to seek God's wisdom. It's a common sense thing to say God's wisdom, he said. Naib Bukele now runs the safest country in the Western Hemisphere, making El Salvador safer than Canada. Interestingly, many El Salvadorians who previously fled to Canada are now fleeing Canada to go back. Imagine if we sought God's wisdom to lead our lives, our families, and our businesses. Imagine if our leaders actually sought God's wisdom, and imagine if they went public about it. It would show a genuine openness to truth. It can happen because the cultural pendulum is now swinging that way. It is swinging back to where it should be, to the side which recognizes truth, love, justice, and that Christ is King. Patrick Meager, Editor, Farmers Forum. Welcome to You've Got to Be Kidding, a podcast that offers a different perspective of life around us. Listen now to author Jonathan Van Bilsen. I seldom write about politics in this column, but events of late have made me wonder when is enough enough. There has recently been a great deal of talk about the forced retirement of the U.S. president, especially in light of two monumental blunders he made last week. The first was during the NATO summit when he introduced the president of Ukraine, Vladimir Zelensky, by saying, please welcome the president of Ukraine, President Putin. He corrected himself by saying, he's going to beat President Putin. However, the damage was done. As if that was not enough, at the same conference, Biden was defending his vice president, Kamala Harris, and unintentionally said, look, I wouldn't have picked Vice President Trump to be vice president if she wasn't qualified to be president. I'm sure the media gurus who run campaign marketing must have been cringing. Even the Republicans are openly endorsing Mr. Biden as a Democratic hopeful for the next election. At 81 now, or 82 in Biden's first year of a second term, we'll put him at 86 when he finishes. In today's world, that age is not old. However, unlike most of us, his past four years have been a compilation of volatility, which surely has taken its toll. The Republicans are not far behind with Mr. Trump running yet again at the young age of 78. Both men have entered an arena by which I see nothing but a scary future not only for the American people, but also for the rest of the world. It made me wonder the ages of previous leaders of the free world, as well as those of our own political figureheads. The youngest president of the U.S. was Theodore Roosevelt, who took office at age 42 after the assassination of William McKinley. John F. Kennedy was 43 when he was inaugurated into the top job. In Canada, the youngest prime minister we've had was none other than Joe Clark, who was 40 the day he was sworn in, a mere three years younger than Justin Trudeau was at the time of his inauguration. The oldest president to lead the U.S. is, of course, Joe Biden, who was 78 when he was sworn in. The second oldest was Ronald Reagan, who was 77. In Canada, our oldest PM was Charles Tupper at the age of 74. Around the world, the oldest leader of a country is Paul Bia, president of Cameroon. He is currently 91 and has been in office for 42 years. The youngest elected official is Gabriel Attal, Prime Minister of France, who is a mere 35 years of age. I don't have an answer on what age someone should be retired from being the leader of a country. But I for one would think when you reach 65 and your CPP and OAS kick in, you'd want to slow down and do a little fishing. I'm Jonathan Van Bilsen and this is You've Got To Be Kidding. You've Got to Be Kidding was presented by X4 Media with permission from the Standard Media Group.
We endeavor to make all information contained in this program as accurate as possible at production time. X4 Media and the Standard Media Group are not responsible for any liabilities resulting from information contained in this program. For more information, please visit x4media.ca. The Standard Podcast was produced by Greenstream Studio for The Standard Newspaper. 